Let's turn to the book of Ezra, chapter 2. We read through most of this list of names of families and uh, tribes and people of certain towns who went back to the land of Israel, the land of Palestine, after the Babylonian captivity, uh, and Cyrus, king of Persia, also king of Babylon at this time, um, gave them freedom and opportunity to leave back to their homeland. And um, I dwelt last time on the inclusion of so many names and uh, trivial details mentioned in the Bible. They seem tedious and tiresome to us when we read them, but if they are connected to Jesus Christ, even slightly or uh, tangentially, uh, God the Father considers them worthy of mention in his book. Um, these, let's read verses 66 through 70 of chapter 2. Their horses were 730 and 6, their mules 240 and 5, their camels 430 and 5, their asses 6,712. And some of the chief of the fathers, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set it up in his place. They gave after their ability unto the treasure of the work threescore and one thousand rams of gold, five thousand pound of silver, one hundred priests' garments. So the priests and the Levites and some of the people and the singers and the porters and the Nethanims dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities." Uh, these horses and camels, etc., mentioned there in verses 66 and 67, are connected with Ezra. And Ezra is connected with the 12 tribes of Jacob. Uh, look forward, if you will, at Ezra 7. Go turn forward one or two pages. Ezra 7, and let's read the first five verses there. Now, after these things... In the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Meraoth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. So Ezra is descended from Aaron. He's in the tribe of Levi. And uh, he's connected with the 12 tribes of Jacob, or the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob is Israel. Genesis 32, where God changed his name. And the New Testament declares that the king of Israel uh, to be God's son. John 1, 49, and you needn't turn, we read, Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And then John writes, And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. John 1.34 uh, The world says, Any friend of so-and-so's is a friend of mine. And First John 5.12 says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. God is interested in his Son. And he's interested in anybody who's interested in his son. And if anything is even remotely connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, it may um, merit mention in God's book. This is how highly he regards the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice again in Ezra 1, verse 9. And this is the number of them, 30 chargers of gold, a 1,000 chargers of silver, 9 uh, and 20 knives. And also go back, if you will, to Exodus 25. Exodus 25. And I want you to notice one verse there, verse 29. Exodus 25, verse 29. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and spoons thereof, and covers thereof, and bowls thereof, 
to cover withal of pure gold shalt thou make them. And the reason I uh, point out those two verses to you is this, the Bible, and this section we're reading here is a historical record of non-essentials. Non-essentials. Um, but those, assen- those non-essentials will be brought up one day at the white throne judgment. Um, Revelation 20, verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Even if the spoons and knives and the dishes and so forth seem trivial to us, God sees them worthy of honorable mention in his book. It's hard for us to figure, but a man um, seeth not as God seeth. And um, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord, neither my ways, your ways. Uh, In God's eyes, those little things are more important than any horse or mule that Muhammad ever rode on or any utensil he ever ate with. God... And I think I had a sermon a few years back, I may, I may dust that one off and preach it again before long, about the, the mule or the, the uh, jackass that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on. The donkey was even predicted in the Old Testament. Behold, thy king cometh to thee meek and riding on, the, on an ass, uh, uh, the, foal, the foal of an ass. Even the, even the ass that Jesus rode in had been prophesied about in the Old Testament. So the things that God sees as important and worthy of mention in his Bible uh, may not be what we would have considered important, but the fact that the Bible dwells on little things like that, which is completely unlike anything any of us would, would write about. If we were writing a religious book, we wouldn't dwell on those kinds of things. We would be dwelling on ethereal um, philosophical and religious things, thinking that that's all the Bible's good for. Uh, but, but that proves to me that no man wrote the Bible. It was inspired by God. Oh, he used men to pen it and put, put it to paper, but it was inspired by God. Because men writing it on their own or acting in collusion to create a religious movement wouldn't have dwelt on that kind of stuff. But God did. And they probably wouldn't have listed so many names and genealogies and records. Um, But God did. And um, the inclusion of those things in the word of God will stand one day as a rebuke to anyone who has doubted anything else in the Bible. Doubting the virgin birth, doubting the, the creation story in the book of Genesis, doubting the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the idea that God... um, gave special mention of those things in his book means that the things God considered to be important and worthy to, and worth believing um, come down to very small details. God just doesn't expect you to believe big stories and sort of grand themes. He wants you to pay attention to the details. And I think that's uh, part and parcel of, of us being Bible believers where we believe every word and every verse is there by the direction and the will of God and so we don't believe it's our job to take out any of it accept it as it is and then trust God to begin teaching you his word verse 70 in our chapter so the priests and the Levites and some of the people and the singers and the porters and the Nethanims dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities Note that Jerusalem is not mentioned among the cities anywhere in Ezra's list here in chapter 2. Now, it's clearly present by the account of the Feast of Tabernacles once we get into chapter 3 and the first six verses. But um, there's an interesting phenomenon in the Bible. I'm going to digress a little bit here for the rest of our time. Uh, There's an interesting phenomenon in the Bible, and it concerns numbers. Um, the mathematic digits, numbers, that turn out to be clues of future events. 
Um, look at Ezra 2 and verse 13. Amid all these lists of names of men and their families, Ezra 2, verse 13, the children of Adonikam, 666. The number 666 shows up here in verse number 13. And there seems to be a um, prevailing connotation, which is negative, of 13 throughout the scriptures. Uh, and sometimes the number 18, which consists of three sixes. Uh, you ever heard, heard the joke about the, the guy that printed uh, $18 bills, tried to spend them, and someone said, there's no such thing as an $18 bill. I tell you, what, what do I do with it? Well, why don't you drive out to the country and find some little country bumpkin and ask if he can change that into real money and uh, pawn the $18 bill off on him. And so he goes and finds this little country store out in the middle of nowhere, and the uh, storekeeper uh, comes to the register and says, can you change this for some smaller bills? And, the, and he thought this fellow wouldn't be wise, and the, the country fellow rings open the cash register and says, how do you want that, in three sixes or two nines? He's going to give it right back at the guy. But the numbers 13 and 6 and 18 all seem to be linked together many, many times, and they tend to be negative. And they're all leading up to uh, the man of sin someday. Uh, Adonikam, his name meant Lord of Rebellion, found there in verse 13. Uh, Nimrod, uh, Nimrod, who led the building of the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis, he was the 13th descendant to follow Adam and led a rebellion. It's funny how um, 13, when, when our country reached 13 colonies, we, we, we rebelled against Great Britain or England. And uh, there were 13 southern states to break away from the Union before the Civil War. And um, so 13 is not, most people consider it to be a very unlucky number and probably with good uh, reason. Look, if you will, back at Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13. And notice there, verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Do me a favor and count the number of words in that verse. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Thirteen words in the thirteenth verse of the thirteenth chapter. The 39 books of the Old Testament, that's 3 times 13, uh, end with a curse. Go, if you will, to the book of Malachi. Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. And he shall turn the heart of the father to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And you can find the curse of the law in two places in the New Testament. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 and verse 39, which is three thirteens. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which... He could not be justified by the law of Moses. Go forward, if you will, to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. Galatians, chapter 3, and verse 13. 
Galatians 3:13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree David's son Absalom's name meant the father of peace but um, he brought no peace to David's household he brought nothing but warfare and bloodshed and rebellion and uh, treachery to his family if you want to run back to 2 Samuel, chapter 18. 2 Samuel 18. And, of course, 18 is three sixes, for whatever that's worth to you. 2 Samuel 18 and verse 18. Now, Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar which is in the king's dale for he said I have no son to keep my name in remembrance and he called the pillar after his own name and it is called unto this day Absalom's place he set up an image to his own memory which is called Absalom's place and we ought to link that with what the Bible says about Judas Iscariot, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether these two thou hast chosen, that it may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. When Christ prayed in John chapter 17, about John 17, verse 12, uh, he said, none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And um, so Judas is called the son of perdition. And in Revelation chapter uh, 17, verse 8, uh, the beast uh, comes and goes into perdition because that's where he's from. He's the son of perdition. And um, although it's, it's not widely taught and very seldom mentioned, it does seem to be, when you take all the related verses together, that Judas will reappear, or at least the soul of Judas Iscariot will come back and reappear in the body of the man of sin. Um, and it's not the subject I intended to study tonight, um, but that's worth looking into in, in the near future. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. Revelation 13, verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. So there you've got a chapter 13, verse 18, and 666 in the verse. Go, if you will, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Matthew 26. And let's begin there at verse 20. Matthew 26, beginning at verse 20. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, it had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. And jump down to verses 48 and 49. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. 
And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Now I'll run forward to John 13. This will be the last text we look at tonight. John 13. John 13, I'll read verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Now notice verse 13. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. Judas never called the Lord Jesus Lord. The others addressed him as master and Lord in time, but Judas never referred to to Jesus as Lord. He only referred to him as master. He wasn't his Lord. By the way, Judas, the name Judas Iscariot in English has 13 letters to it. And uh, all those numbers all seem to be, those verses all seem to be connected um, to point towards something negative or someone negative who is going to reappear in the future. And the number of loyalty to him will be 666. And um, there's got to be, there's a pattern to it that I don't fully understand yet. But there are other verses very similar uh, throughout the Bible in a chapter 13 and a verse 13 here and, and the same there that uh, seem to have some negative uh, overtone to it, something that's um, contrary to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to stop with that right there. But that idea of digging deeper into the Bible and seeing little things that are on the surface that might indicate some pattern in the future. That seemed to escape modern day Bible commentators and modern day radio preachers and so forth. And it comes from, uh, for us, it, it it's, should be the outgrowth of saying, I'm a Bible believer. And what I mean by that is I believe every word on the page that I'm reading is the word of God. And um, and I don't believe it's my job to correct the Bible. I don't even think it's our job to correct the punctuation. Leave it. Leave that alone. Uh, just play it safe and leave that alone. And uh, trust God to teach you the Bible. Doesn't it seem self-evident that if I go to God... And the same Holy Spirit who inspired the men to write this book now lives inside of my heart and um, is gradually changing my thoughts and my conscience as I seek to live for Christ. Doesn't it make some sense that he should be the one to teach me his Bible if I compare, ask him to and compare Scripture with Scripture and let the Scriptures interpret themselves? If, if he can't teach me the Word of God, that way, then I promise you no man can teach me the Word of God. If the Holy Spirit who wrote the book in the first place can't teach it to me, then why would I expect someone else to teach it to me? Uh, Because no one knows it as well as he knows it. And, um, but there, when you say I'm a Bible believer, do you really believe everything you're holding in your hands is there by the will and the direction and providence of God. And uh, I have to say, yes, I do. Uh, Do I profess to understand all of it? Absolutely not. Uh, Nobody does. But believing that it's right to start with is the best place to begin. And um, I met a guy today who said he had the denomination he was with. He was some sort of a state superintendent, and um, he had started you know over a hundred congregations in uh, other states and up and down California and uh, I wanted to ask him listen does that 
does your denomination have any kind of stand or take any kind of position on all the multiple Bibles that are out there? Because they don't all say the same thing. But I didn't get a chance to ask him. He he left the um, the funeral service early because he had other engagements, and I guess he didn't want to sit for three and a half hours for a real long funeral. I didn't want to sit there either, but I was getting paid to be there, so so it worked out well. 